Hey you guys, this is gonna be chapter nine, The Undercover Cowboys. After taking over the Oklahoma City field office in July of 1925, White reviewed the Bureau's voluminous files on the Osage murders, which had been amassed over the previous two years. Murder cases that are not solved quickly are often never solved, and that's true today. Evidence dries up, Memories fade. More than four years had elapsed since the killings of Anna Brown and Charles Whitehorn, and frequently the only way to crack such cases is, is to find an overlooked clue submerged within the original cache of records. The files on the murders of the Osage contained history in its rawest forms, bits of data vacuumed up without any chronology or narrative, like a, nov like a novel whose pages were out of order. White scoured his randomness for a hidden design, though he had, though he was accustomed, sorry, um, on the frontier to dealing with violent death. The brutality detailed in the reports was breathtaking. An agent wrote of the bombing of the Smith's house. The two women perished instantly, their bodies being blown asunder and pieces of their flesh being found plastered on a house 300 feet away. Previous agents had concentrated on the six cases that seemed most likely to be solved. The bombing deaths of Rita Smith and her husband, Bill Smith and their servant, Nettie Brookshire, and the fatal shooting of Anna Brown, Henry Roan, and Charles Whitehorn. White struggled to find links among all the two dozen murders, but a few things were, ev were evident. Rich Osage Indians were being targeted, and three of the victims, Anna Brown, Rita Smith, and their mother, Lizzie, were blood-related. Surprisingly, agents hadn't spoken to Lizzie's surviving daughter, Mar Molly Burkhart. Investigators were taught to see the world through the eyes of, of others. But how could White fathom what this woman had seen, from being born in a lodge on the, on the wild prairie to being catapulted into a fortune, fortune to being terrorized as her family and other Osage were picked off one by one? The files offered few insights about Molly's life, mentioning only that she, will, she was ill with diabetes and had secluded herself in her house. A few details in the files seemed telling. Repeat killings tend to, re, t repeat killers tend to rigidly adhere to a routine, yet the Osage murders were carried out in a bewildering, bewildering array of methods. There was no signature. This, along with the fact that the bodies turned up in different parts of the state and country, suggested that, that this was not the work of a single killer. Instead, whoever was behind the crimes must have employed henchmen. The nature of the murders of the murderers, who also gave some insight into the mastermind. The person was not an impulsive killer, but a con connoisseur of plots, who was intelligent enough to understand toxic substances and calcula calculating enough to carry out his diabolical vision over years. As White scrutinized the data and reports, one plausible story line after another seemed to, to cohere. But upon close inspection, the information invariably traced back to the same dubious sources, private eyes and local lawmen, whose opinions were based on little more than hearsay. Given that the corruption seemed to permeate every institution in Osage County, these sources might be intentionally spreading disinformation in order to conceal the real plot. White realized that the greatest problem with the earlier investigations were not that agents had failed to uncover any leads, it was that there was too many. Agents would develop one, then simply drop it, or fail to corroborate it, or to conclusively disapprove it disprove it. Even when agents seemed to be moving on the right track, they had not managed to produce any evidence that would be admissible in a court of law. As White strove to be a modern evidence man, he had to learn some new techniques. Most of the mo but the most useful one was, was, uh, was timeless cold, cold, but the most useful one was timeless, coldly, methodically separating hearsay from facts that he could prove, 
He didn't want to hang a man simply because he had constructive, a seductive tale. And after years of bumbling, potentially crooked investigations and the Osage murderers, White needed to, to weed out half facts and build an indubitable narrative based on what he called an unbroken chain of evidence. White pre preferred to investigate his cases alone, but given the number of murders and leads to follow, he realized he would need to assemble a team. Yet even a team wouldn't overcome one of the main obstacles that had stymied previous investigators. The refusal of witnesses to, to cooperate because of prejudice, corruption, or as an agent put it, almost universal fear, fear of being bumped off. So White decided he would be the public face of the investigation, while most of the agents operated undercover. Hoover promised him, I'll assign as many men as you need. Recognizing the limits of his college boys, Hoover had kept on the rolls a, a handful of other cowboys, including White's brother, Doc. These agents were still learning the scientific sleuthing, still adjusting to completing the reports on a typewriter. But White decided that these men were the only candidates who could handle such an assignment. Infiltrating wild country, dealing with outlawry, shadowing suspects, going days without sleep, maintaining cover under duress, and handling deadly weapons if necessary. White began putting together a squad of cowboys, but he didn't include Doc. Since serving in the Rangers, he and his brother had avoided being assigned to the same cases in order to pr protect their family from potentially losing two members at once. White first recruited a former New Mexico sheriff who at 56 became the oldest member of the team, though reserved to the point of being shy, the sheriff was adept at assuming undercover identities, having pretended to be everything from a cow rustler to a counterfeiter. When they en enlisted a stocky and blonde haired fo former Texas Ranger, who according to a superior was best suited for situations where there is an, any element of danger, in addition, White brought on an experiment, an experienced deep cover operative who looked more like an insurance salesman or perhaps because it was of his former pr profession. One agent from the previous investigation, White decided should be retained, John Berger. He had a comprehensive knowledge of the case from the suspects of, the tra of trails of evidence and he had developed an extensive network of, of, of informants. Then it included many outlaws, but because Berger was, was already well known in Osage County, he would work openly with White. So would another agent, Frank Smith, a Texan who listed his interests thus, pistol and rifle practice, big game hunting, game fishing, mountain climbing, adventures, man hunting, Man hunting. Sounds like Dog the Bounty Hunter. In Hoover's Bureau, Smith was classified as one of the older type of uneducated agents. Finally, White brought in the singular John Wren, a one-time spy for the revolutionary, revolutionary leaders of Mexico. Wren was a rarity in the Bureau. An American Indian, quite possibly he was the only one Wren was part Ute, 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 a tribe that had flourished in what is today Colorado and Utah. I believe the Ute Indians are from uh, northern Utah. And he had swirled, a swirled mustache and black eyes. He was a gifted investigator, but he'd recently washed out of the Bureau for failing to file reports and meet regulations. A special agent in charge had said of him with exasperation, he is exceedingly skilled in handling cases, and some of his work can only be described as brilliant. But, but of what avail are so many nights and days of hard, of hard application to duty if the results are not em embodied in written reports? He had all the information in his head, but will not commit to it on paper. In March of 1925, Hoover had 
reinstated Wren, but only after warning him, unless you measure up to the standards that are now in, in effect in the Bureau, I will be compelled to request your resignation. White knew that Wren would bring an essential perspective to the team. Some of the previous agents on the case, including Berger, had betrayed the, the kind of casual prejudice toward the Osage that was then commonplace. In a joint report, Berger and another agent had stated, the Indians in general are lazy, pathetic, cowardly, dissipated. And Berger, Berger's colleague insisted that the only way to make any of these dissolve stubborn Osage Indians talk and tell what they know is to cut off their allowance, and if necessary, throw them in jail. Such contempt had deepened the Osage distrust of the federal agents and hindered their investigation. But Wren, who referred to himself as one of Hoover's braves, had capably had had capable capably handed, handled many delicate cases on reservations. White relayed to Hoover which men he wanted, and those not already assigned to the Oklahoma office received urgent orders and code from headquarters. Proceed under cover immediately reporting to agent in charge, Tom White. Once the team had been assembled, White grabbed his gun and set out for Osage County, another travel, traveler in the midst. Hey guys, if you enjoyed that uh, chapter nine, please give me a like, thumbs up, please comment, and all that good stuff. And I'll see you guys tomorrow for another chapter. Chapter 10.